I know that if I remain really still, you guys won't be able to see me. The reason I know this is because of the killer in When a Stranger Calls Back. You guys can see me, can't you? Shit. When a Stranger Calls Back stars Carol Kane, Charles Durning, Jill Sholin, and is directed by Fred Walton. What's up, guys? As you know, I recently reviewed uh, When a Stranger Calls from 79, the remake. Now we're going to close it off. We're going to do When a Stranger Calls Back. And uh, I wasn't originally planning on doing When a Stranger Calls Back, but then I noticed in the comments so many of you from both the previous reviews were saying you got to check out when a stranger calls back because the opening is great and some of you even said you prefer the opening to this movie over the original 79 opening i disagree with you but i still think the opening to when a stranger calls back is really good and it is easily the best part of the movie for sure it's all downhill from there but uh, there's some good stuff about this movie for sure and it's it's interesting when you talk about the behind the scenes and the backstory of this so we're going to get into all that. But first off, the uh, the Blu-ray, I bought that right after you guys told me about the opening to this movie. I had to kind of go through a back door on Amazon to find this because if you type in When a Stranger Calls Back Blu-ray, I don't think this pops up. What pops up is an edition of When a Stranger Calls that actually includes this on it. Or I think I, I actually typed in the DVD. And then when I clicked on the DVD, when I saw other options, I found the Blu-ray and I found this. Like I said, I had to go into a back door. It was kind of weird, but this is the Shout Factory edition. Uh, if you want just this movie because you own the others, then uh, this is the one to get for sure. Great picture quality. And uh, I guess we'll start off with um, the, the technical specs because this is actually, let me put this down, presented in uh, the four by three aspect ratio, the, the one three three. And the reason for that is because this was a TV movie that was that was on Showtime. Uh, you know, this did not come to theaters and they, they worked out a deal with Showtime for this to become a TV movie. And back then in 93, TV movies were in one three three aspect ratio. So if you get this Blu-ray that I just showed you, there is a 185 ratio that'll open up to your full widescreen TV, but know that it's just zoomed in. And for me, I always prefer to watch the original intended uh, aspect ratio, just because I want as much information on the frame as possible. So I watched this in the 133, so that way I saw more of the top and the bottom, because that's just the way it was filmed. So isn't that the way you would want to watch it, the way the director filmed it? I did. Fuck you, I'm trying to help you, motherfucker. But first off, let's get into a quick plot synopsis. By the way, this will be a spoiler review. If I'm doing a movie that's over 30 years old, sorry, I'm gonna talk about spoilers, okay? It's worth checking out though, I'll tell you guys that. But uh, yeah, quick plot synopsis. Uh, this opens similarly to the original 79 version where you have a babysitter uh, going to this house uh, but the circumstances are a little different. Like, like the first thing she does is she goes and she checks the two children. She doesn't know anything about what happened in the past. At least it's not said that she does in the movie. But uh, what makes this one interesting is this guy shows up at the door. He asks her uh, to help out because he is stranded. His car broke down according to him. I'll call them for you. I can do it. I don't want to put you through any trouble. You can trust me. It's okay. What do you want me to tell them? At first you think she's going to let him in. You know, he asked her to let him in. And she says, I won't let you in, but what I will do is I will call for you. And so he gives her the information, but when she goes to make the call, what she notices is that there's no dial tone. And earlier the phone rang and there was a dial tone. So already something's rotten in Denmark. This opening is probably about as long as the opening from the original. It feels like it's about 20 minutes. Very similarly to the, the opening of the original, it's more based on tension. And you definitely feel it in this opening scene. And it's unique because 
This is probably a situation that a lot of you have been in in your own lives, especially women, uh, where you're just on the other side of the door. The only thing that separates you from the possible danger is a door that's about uh, an inch and a half thick. Why don't you just go away and leave me alone? And we can all relate to that. And especially when the danger is right there on the other side of the door and he's not being threatening, you know? Which, thankfully he's not because if he was, she would really be in deep shit because the phone line's not working. And uh, this is uh, just a different form of tension because we don't know if this guy on the other end of the door is dangerous or not. At least not at first, but then he keeps coming back. And the more he comes back, the more we don't trust him. And the more Julia does not trust him. What do you want? You never called them, did you? You never called the auto club. Yes, I did. Of course I did. And also what makes this so great too is Julia makes the right decisions pretty much every step of the way. She never opens that door. She tricks him into thinking that she made the phone call. Or does she? Because he might even know that the line's broken. Because we don't know if this guy is the guy that's in the house. And they're already establishing that there's somebody in the house because of a couple of clues along the way. The phone line being dead. Uh, she writes down all the information that he gives her. But then... At some point when she goes back, she notices that the information is gone. So we know somebody's in that house, but we don't know if it's the guy outside the door or if it's actually uh, another party that's inside the house. And so as this incredible tension builds, at the end of the scene, the guy sort of puts his cards on the table and says, Julia, listen to me very carefully. You don't live here, do you? You're just a babysitter. Have you been upstairs in the last five minutes? Why? I don't think you're alone in this house. I know that there's somebody in your house. You need to get out of there as quick as possible. But then again, she doesn't know if she could trust this guy or not. If she opens that door and goes out there, she could be dead anyway. So really, the scene is not about the punchline. This whole scene is about the constant tension building, and it doesn't matter what that punchline is. You're already there. They already have you. Whereas most horror movies, especially today, they have you at the punchline, you know? And really what, what happens before the punchline usually isn't that great. It's usually somebody just doing something ordinary, and then uh, they're sneak attacked from behind or something like that. Hello. And to me, that's kind of cheap. Especially when you go back and look at movies like this where they have you for a good 10, 15, 20 minutes. And so you're just begging them to let you off the hook. And then when they let you off the hook, like I said, it doesn't really matter. You see the killer is in the house and he's you know, walking towards her. And at this point, you're kind of confused because you're thinking, wait, if somebody's on the other side of that door, then because of sound and location, she should not be hearing the voice inside the house. And so this is where the story kind of falls flat for me because we find out that this is a ventriloquist and he has the ability to manipulate his voice to sound like it's in a different location. But I can only buy that so far. But when you're on the other side of a door, I'm sorry, but there's no way that you're gonna be able to manipulate your voice from inside the house to sound like it's outside that door. No way in hell. But luckily, like I said, they have you for the 20 minutes. That's, the, that's the, the, the chocolate cake. So one thing that's cool about this movie too is it brings back all the, the key players from the original. You got Charles Durning, you got Carol Kane, and you have Fre uh, Fred Walton, the director, coming back. So it's nice to have that continuity. You can compare this to the original because of Fred Walton's direction, uh, how he constantly leans on tension. And I think this one holds up to the first quite well, not as good, but still very effective, you know, and it has kind of the same template. You know, the original had that opening 20 minutes and then we follow the path of the killer. Well, in this one, we don't follow the path of the killer. We jump five years and we follow the path of the prey, Julia. Uh, Julia is constantly taunted by this killer still five years later and 
What makes this such a, a dangerous situation is that he, he's a smart killer. He knows what the cops will investigate and what they will discard. You know, he does things like move a book out of the way, you know, or just really mundane things that make you think that this character is kind of losing her mind, going crazy. We even ourselves start questioning this. Uh, the only person that believes in her is Jill. Carol Kane, uh, you know, this is a character that went through a similar ordeal in the first movie. And it followed her for quite a few years after. And then she had to deal with it seven years later again. So, of course, Jill went into law enforcement to protect herself. And luckily, Jill is there for Julia. Now, after that opening segment, this movie, for the most part, uh, like I said, it's following in the footsteps of Julia. The killer does present himself like in the last act of the movie. And this is the strangest freaking killer I think I've ever seen. A, he's a ventriloquist, which is weird. B, he paints his body up. And I, there's a section in the movie where he is literally in blackface. Um, I was like, wow, I can't believe they got away with this. If you guys remember, there was a movie called Soul Man way back in the day. This wasn't a horror movie. This was more of like a, a, a drama comedy, a dramedy with C. Thomas Howe. And he gets into a college by putting blackface on. How in the hell this movie got made, I have no idea. Crazy. But this was kind of a similar case, but not as profound as that. You know, because that was pretty much the whole movie. Whereas this, there's like a sex in the movie where he's literally got blackface on. Uh, just because he's doing this ventriloquist act on stage and he, you know, he wants to be in the shadows. He doesn't want to be seen at all. And that's a recurring theme throughout the rest of the movie. There is some creepy scenes with him though. Like there's one scene where, let me set it up for you. Julia attempts suicide. What's confusing about this is that Jill and Cliff, Charles Durning, they're on the case trying to find the killer. They present the idea that maybe the killer tried to kill her and she didn't commit suicide and that's never really answered. So you, you walk out of this movie not knowing if she actually tried to kill herself or not. At least I didn't. But if you look behind the scenes, they were really going to kill her off in the movie. But Showtime came forward and said, no, we want a happier ending. So that's why she ended up living. You know, the, the suicide attempt didn't pan out for her. So, so I don't know if that's supposed to make you happy because she's still going to be royally jacked up for the rest of her life. And in the end, it was kind of pointless to have um, her live anyway because she really says like a couple words at the end of the movie, but she's bed stricken for the rest of the movie. It's kind of like Halloween 6 where uh, in the producer's cut, Jimmy Lloyd doesn't die and then you see her in the hospital later and then she's killed at gunpoint. And really in the middle section of the movie, there's no real like chase for the killer. Uh, it's more of uh, detective work and some of it can be boring. But there is a scene where you see Julia in the bed and then the killer kind of comes out of the shadows and he's just staring at her. He's kind of a pervert too because later in the movie, uh, Jill finds these uh, photographs of the killer and he was looking at nude pictures of Julia, taking advantage of her while she was uh, in a coma. So really sick, sadistic killer for sure. So there's a final showdown between Jill and the killer and I almost gut laughed because he painted himself uh, the, the, the background, like the brick wall, but half of his body is like a brick wall and the other half is like dark. Just the amount of work that one would have to do to paint themselves up like that, I'm calling bullshit. There's no way in hell. So I guess the bottom line here is this killer, while interesting and unique, uh, not nearly as interesting as uh, Kurt from the previous movie. But it is nice that this movie was dedicated to the memory of Tony Beckley, who played the killer in the first movie. But Kurt was a much more interesting character than this guy. Also, I got to give Jill Sholin credit, who played Julia. I thought she was very well cast, and I like her backstory, too, how when she auditioned for the part, she went in with, like, no makeup. She's very introverted. And every other girl that tried out for that part, they, you know, they were all done up to the nines, makeup, everything. And they all look kind of the same. And so Fred Walton ended up picking her because... He kind of casted her to type. He wanted her to be really introverted. And I think she brought a unique quality to the role that didn't feel cookie cutter like every other young actress uh, of that time. Or I guess, you know, even today, a lot of these young actresses today that we see on movies and TV, 
they all do seem kind of cookie cutter and, and this cut from the same cloth. I mean, you, like take any Netflix show these days. It, it seems like every young actress, many times they're interchangeable. So I like that quality that uh, Jill Sholin brought to the table. And overall, guys, for a TV movie, I thought the, the production value of this movie was actually pretty decent. It still felt kind of cinematic, even though it was in a, a 1-3-3 aspect ratio. Still worked. And I think that's because of Fred Walton's direction. You know, same director from the first movie, which is kind of a unique case, too. So in the end, guys, I'm going to give this a high humdrum. Uh, that opening is definitely very impactful. I even showed that opening to my wife after, and I was like, I want you to watch this and tell me if this, if this works for you. I was curious. And sure enough, she said that was a really good opening, actually. And that was, uh, that was her favorite part of the movie, too. So if you've seen Winter Stranger Calls Back, uh, I definitely recommend picking up this Blu-ray. Uh, it's, it's worth watching. If you like nice, tension-filled, nail-biting thrillers, then this one's definitely one to get. Also, be sure to come over to Killer Flicks, where we talk about all day and every day and on Fridays. We do Free for Fridays. Follow me at Drum Dums on my socials. Support me on Patreon. Buy me a coffee. And anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. And Drum Dum out.